I, like the brethren that have spoken tonight, uh, was born into a Christian home. But unlike them, I wasn't saved uh, till I was 33 years of age. Uh, I wasn't always thankful that I was born into a Christian home. There's times I wished I'd been born into just any kind of a home rather than a Christian home. But now I thank God every day for saving my father and mother and for saving my mother's father and mother as well. Uh, and uh, if you live in a Christian home, you should count it a great privilege. I went to a Sunday school and a gospel hall like this wasn't really as big as this, but there were about 300 children in the Sunday school and about 250 to 300 people always in fellowship. And it was a great place in those days. It's not just so big now. But I, uh, although I, I paid attention in Sunday school, I enjoyed the, the teachers and I thank God for all of those that taught me the word in Sunday school. But I rebelled against the word. I suppose when I was younger, I maybe really wanted to be saved. But then as I got older, I, I was rebellious and I got away uh, altogether uh, from uh, the thoughts of God and salvation. That doesn't mean I didn't go to meetings. I went to Bible readings till I was 20 years of age. And I often went to gospel meetings. And afterward, I'd go away to the other side of Belfast where you wouldn't I'd go today, it'd be very dangerous, and I'd go to dance in some parochial hall. But I was away without going into a lot of details. I was occupied in sports and occupied in the pleasures of the world. During one outing, I'll call it an outing, a wild night maybe you would call it, I met a young woman, and that young woman eventually became my wife. And I thank God for her, and I thank God that, uh, although I didn't know it when I met her, uh, that she had gone to a gospel hall Sunday school for many, many years, and her mother was saved uh, through the preaching of the gospel in the gospel hall uh, in her village or town. So it's good to be able to look back and see God's hand in these things. We were married, and after we were married, in 1957. In 1961, we came to the United States. And the reason we came to Ferndale, Michigan, was that my wife had an aunt that lived there, and she had no children, and she and Uncle Andrew thought it would be nice if they could have some family living in the area. So we came, and I went to a few gospel meetings, but I really didn't have uh, much interest. Sometimes I couldn't get out of it. And I remember particularly uh, two meetings that I went to in the West Chicago Gospel Hall. Uh, one, the preacher was a man I'd gone to high school with his brother. I don't remember his text or anything about him, but uh, the, all I got from that meeting was that the longer I stay in my sins, the greater pile of sins there is between me and God. Then I went to another meeting, and I learned from that uh, that uh, I needed to make up my mind. If I was really going to be saved, I needed to go in for it uh, and not just uh, keep putting it off, even though sometimes at this time I had felt I need to be saved and other times I felt that I was, uh, just didn't really need it. But another preacher once uh, said, strive to enter in at the straight gate. And he explained that to, to strive meant to agonize, to really be in earnest. And those are three things along with others that God uh, used to speak to me. Now, I thought I had a fairly good life in the United States. I was a manager of an export office down in the city of Detroit. And one of the fringe benefits, I thought it was a benefit anyhow, was I got invited to all the cocktail parties uh, and all the ships that came into the harbor. People wanted your business and they did all kinds of things to get your business. And I thought, this is a life for an Irishman. It's all free. What more could a person have? But you see, uh, way at the back of my mind, I knew that this wasn't the answer, that there was something missing in my life, uh, that uh, all the pleasure you could get out of the world that doesn't really satisfy. There's no lasting satisfaction in the pleasures of sin. Mo uh, Moses found that out, and he said, I'd rather be with God's people, with the slaves, than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. 
So in many ways, God was speaking to me. I can't really take time to go into that. But one night in 1966, it was March the 9th, my wife and I were lying in bed. We were talking to each other, and I asked her a question. I said, Margaret, do you ever think you're going to be in heaven? And she said, well, I hope that one day I'll, I'll end up in heaven. And I said, you know, you could lay your head in the pillow and die in your sleep, and you'd be in hell. And, of course, uh, I just turned over on my side and went to sleep. But she couldn't sleep. She thought if I lay my head on the pillow, I might die in my sleep, and I'd be down in hell. And then she started to pray, and she started to pray for me. She thought that I knew more about it than she did, and if I could get saved, maybe I could help her. And she prayed and prayed that God would save me. God answered her prayer, but not, uh, well, it was a few hours. I'm going to say not right away, but 12 hours later. But however, uh, she didn't seem to be getting anywhere in her prayer for me. So she thought, you know, I should be asking God to show me how that I could be saved. That is how that she could be saved. So she changed her prayer and she asked God to show her, show me. And I often tell people, if you really want to be saved, ask God to show you. He's the Savior God. He's ready and he's willing and he's able to save. So she prayed, Lord, show me how I can get this salvation. And, of course, God showed her. How did he show her? Through John 3 and 16. A verse that she had learned in Sunday school came back to her memory. And she thought of God, uh, would I give my son? We have only one son, you know, Mark, our son. Three daughters, one son. Would I give my son for the greatest person on all the earth? She said, no, I wouldn't. But God gave his son for me. And there she realized that Christ was not only given into the world, but he was given to the cross at Calvary. People are celebrating his birth. They know he came into the world, but they don't really know uh, why he came. At least a lot of them don't. But there she realized why he came. He gave him to Calvary to die for her. She wasn't really all that sure. And she thought, I should maybe wake Bill up and see if he can help me. And uh, so I said, if I wake him up, it was 2.30 in the morning. She said he'd never get to sleep and he'd never get to work the next day. So she told me the next morning, and of course I was really surprised, very shocked. I'd often wonder, wondered if God saved me and she wasn't saved, what kind of a life would we have together? And that's something else I thank God for, that he took that out of my way. Well, I went to work and I couldn't work. And about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I left my office and I went into a place where I could be alone. And I said, Lord, I'm not leaving this place. I remembered what one of the preachers said. I'm not leaving this place until I get the matter settled. I want this salvation. And I remember the other, what the other preacher said, strive to enter in at the straight gate. And I said, Lord, I'm in earnest. I want this salvation. And the more I thought about it and the more verses came to my memory, the, the worse it became. And then I thought of this scripture that we have read together. Before I had taken down a Bible and searched around trying to find something. Uh, and uh, this is one of the scriptures that God brought me to. And I had a whole little outline here, but you're not going to hear it. You're just going to hear this. I remembered Peter walking in the water. They began to sink. And I said, Lord, that's me. I don't seem to be able to work this thing out. I'm just sinking. Can't do a thing. Sinking right down to a burning hell. And that's where I deserve to be. But thank God I remembered what Peter said. He said, Lord, save me. And all of a sudden, it came to me like this. I'm the sinner that can do absolutely nothing. But Christ is a Savior who has done everything. And right there and then, I was saved by the grace of God. You say, did you feel better? Well, I'll tell you, my salvation wasn't based on feeling, but I'll tell you how I felt. I felt stunned. Is it possible after all these years, hearing the gospel? I heard Mr. Paisley when he first went preaching. That's a while ago. And I heard many another person since. But you see, you can hear the gospel, but that's not salvation. It's getting to that point in one's life where I really want this. 
And I'm not going to let anything stop being determined. And God just opened it up to me like this. I'm the sinner that can do nothing. He's the Savior that has done everything. I went home from work that day, and I asked Margaret, I said, do you still think you're saved? She said, I know I'm saved. What made her so sure? Well, she opened up the, the, the Bible. She didn't know where to open. She opened at random, and it opened at Lamentations chapter 3. And uh, that <clears throat> is what we normally call a clean part of your Bible. Some of us don't know much about it even yet, but I know this. She read words something like this. I cried unto thee out of the low dungeon. Hide not thine ear at my breathing, at my cry. I drew near in the day that I called upon thee. Thou hast redeemed my life. That's how she knew. How does anyone know they're saved? How would anyone know they're a sinner? The word of God tells us all of sin. How would anyone know that Christ died for sinners? One of our brethren read that verse, God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How do we know that that will save us? Well, our brother Valence, he read John 3 and 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. There's no mistake about it. It's a great thing to be saved, but there's something greater. You know what that is? Really knowing it for sure. Being saved and knowing it from the word of God. And of course, we never cease to thank God for that day when he saved my wife and I. Two in the same day. Wonderful thing to be saved and uh, uh, have an, an opportunity and opportunities to preach the gospel to others. There's nothing like it. Nothing like being in the family of God. Years ago, I just told <clears throat> our brother, Moore, this, uh, well, after his father died. So way back, we weren't saved very long. We went to Toronto, our family, and uh, we were meeting someone uh, from the airport. My wife's sister was coming over from, uh, from Ireland, and uh, we stayed with the Moors. Glenn was a little younger in those days, and we stayed with them, and his father, Henderson Moore, he, uh, he, he had to get his hair cut. And I said, I'll go with you. And we went in, and uh, he introduced me to the barber. And he said, uh, this man is my brother. And he said, this is the first time I met him was just a today. My, that was a puzzle for the barber. He was an Italian fellow. He was scratching his head uh, and wondering how he could figure that out. And of course, Henderson let him think about it for a while. He wanted to have a, the right impact. And then he, was, he told him, we're brothers in the Lord. There's nothing like it. That's the first time I met him. But we see we were right in the same family. And that is, this has happened, oh, dozens of times, even in different countries, meeting people never met before. Feel right at home. Why? Because we're all in God's great family. There's nothing like it. And I hope that through the testimonies of our brethren, that God will speak to your heart and to your conscience tonight. And that you'll be brought into all the blessings of salvation. To know the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that loved us so much. To know him as our own and personal savior. And to be brought into God's family and looking forward to that day of his coming. Could be tonight. The Lord could come.